Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Ureka Tuesday number 248. We are extremely happy to welcome Teddy Cruz and Paula Foreman all the way from San Diego. Uh, so thank you uh, to Professor Vassal for the invitation. Thank you to you, Teddy and Fauna, for making it. Thank you, Tristan, for being here with us. And just a short reminder, after the lecture, there will be the possibility to ask questions in the YouTube live chat or on our Telegram channel um, that we will then discuss with the two. Um, so now I will give the word over to Professor, Professor Vassal and he can give a short introduction. And then we're very excited to start with the lecture, and I hope everyone enjoys themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I am really um, pleased that um, um, Fona and Teddy are here for this uh, lecture at Udeka Tuesday, and I really uh, want to thank you uh, a lot for their uh, uh, to give this lecture it, uh, in, uh, for, for you, Deca Tuesday. It's, um, I think, the, their work uh, in San Diego at the frontier of uh, US and Mexico is uh, absolutely essential. Uh, and uh, I went there one time and I always remember this uh, incredible situation. And uh, it is clear that working precisely at this point of uh, uh, in the world is uh, something uh, incredibly uh, important. I remember on one side a huge national park, natural park, totally empty with some visitors sometimes and some policemen on horses and some helicopters in the sky. And on the other side, a super active, dense, an incredible activity of an informal city, Tijuana. And between the two, a wall made of pylons that was diving in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, I remember that I, we went there with uh, Gilles Clément, the landscape architect, and we we went to this little house in the Tijuana side, uh, which was the cultural center named the Casa del Tunnel. And precisely, Pona and Teddy are working there in this absolutely incredible situation, in this point of geography that it is so important. And um, I am really happy that uh, they could talk about their, their work at Odeka Tuesday. Unfortunately, it is online, but I really like that one later, there could be a possibility that they come to Berlin and to talk directly with you. So from very far away, from uh, San Diego, uh, Fona, Teddy, thanks again, thanks a lot for your participation to you, Decatur Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jean-Philippe, um, for this invitation and for um, this opening. Indeed, we are, um, our work is embedded in a space of pro profound ambiguity and contradiction. And we're very excited to share our work here with you today. We really see, Teddy, are you going to share your screen? Oh, hold on just one moment. Maybe just quickly uh, unmute yourself. Yes, That's unmute. Possible. One moment. Yes, sorry. Okay, we are now here. All oh, right. There was something, I'm sorry, with the sharing. Okay, perfect. And then optimize to motion and video.
Okay. Excellent. Okay. There we go. So we really see this region where we come from as a microcosm of all of the injustices and indignities that are experienced by vulnerable people across the world. Political violence, climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality, and the steady decay of public thinking. So we live and work just a few miles away from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. San Diego, Tijuana has become a lightning rod of American nativism. And all the, though the news cameras sort of come and go, tens of thousands of Central American and Haitian migrants wait at this wall for asylum that never comes. Reviled by the Mexican public as a nuisance or an infestation, it, the language is terrible, or else they sit in U.S. detention centers as tools of deterrence, exposed to a raging pandemic, and until very recently exposed uh, and separated forcibly from their children. It has been particularly devastating in recent years to witness the emotional impact on children, their fear and the inevitable psychic internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. Hopefully there's relief on the horizon. This remains to be seen, but the prospect of more border porosity in the coming period is drawing even more people north. Conditions are intensifying here every day and climate change will inevitably accelerate these flows in the coming years. A recent United Nations survey found that 72% of arriving migrants at our southern border here are agricultural workers, and that agricultural instability was a major factor in their decision to walk north. Everyone tends to see northward migration in this part of the world as a function of poverty and violence, and of course this is accurate, but climate change is making things worse. Climate change is what we call a threat multiplier. It deepens human suffering, makes poverty and food insecurity worse. It aggravates violence, accelerates human displacement, and ultimately compounds the reason why people leave their homes. Some international agencies refuse to characterize these people as refugees, seeing them instead as economic migrants who are pulled toward a better life rather than pushed away by catastrophe. And this distinction is significant because it means that these people are not entitled to international refugee protection under the Geneva Convention. This kind of thinking needs to change in an era of accelerating climate migration for huge people across the world who depend on agriculture and who depend on the sea. The economy and the environment are the exact same thing. Climate change is expected to become the biggest driver of human displacement in the next decades. 10% of the global population is at risk. The 2022 IPCC report projects 1 billion climate migrants by the year 2050, disproportionately affecting Asia, Latin America, and Africa, which today already represent well over 90% of all climate displaced people. And we are becoming too familiar with what this looks like on the ground. Here, flooding and displacement in low-lying coastal regions like Bangladesh. Extreme heat waves like this one in Pakistan in 2015, which claimed 2,000 lives. As an urban heat island, the city of Karachi can't cool off at night and the poor have nowhere but the street to cool off and escape the heat. Accelerating weather extremes like Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in 2005, which is still the emblematic case of climate injustice in the United States, as underserved Black residents were the last to be rescued, were warehoused in treacherous conditions, and were ultimately last to be resettled. The city is shining again, but many Black residents forcibly displaced still have not returned to their homes. Or take the example of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico a few years ago, which stranded millions of American island citizens while the humanitarian response arrived immediately to Maria's mainland hurricane victims in the US. 
We are seeing accelerating droughts across the globe, producing agricultural failure, skyrocketing food prices, famine here a few years ago in northern Afghanistan, and a 30-year drought across the Sahel Belt uh, of sub-Saharan Africa has taken millions of lives here, internally displaced Somalis flee from drought toward makeshift camps. It's important to recognize too that decades of drought in Syria played a role in the turbulence of the recent period. Agricultural failure drove people to the, to the cities in masses, which couldn't handle the migratory flows, misery and poverty ignited disaffection, civil unrest, and ultimately revolution. Now, it wouldn't be accurate to say that climate change caused the Syrian conflict, but here again, climate change was a threat multiplier. It aggravated conditions for human displacement and conflict. And what has been our response in the US and Europe? Fortress walls, suspension of asylum laws, and a political rhetoric of hatred. And now the arrival of Ukrainian refugees seeking asylum across the world here in Tijuana and elsewhere is raising important questions about race and preferential treatment. Now in San Diego, Tijuana, border communities and activists on both sides of the wall continue to confront injustice and productively circumvent policies and practices that criminalize migrants. Some of this activity is about sanctuary and protecting people who are targeted by the state. Some of it is working through the courts, the detention centers, and other institutions of power to advocate for people who are ensnared in the net of political violence. Some of it takes the shape of bottom-up democratic agency that exposes and counters unjust power and confronts hateful political narratives. Much of it arises informally within communities themselves through everyday collective practices of adaptation and resilience in conditions of scarcity and danger. Over the years, Teddy and I have accompanied much of this bottom-up emancipatory activity in close partnership with agencies at the front lines. In, in recent years, these struggles have often attracted artists and cultural producers from around the world to engage in gestures of performative protest. But we've really become critical of this uptick in ephemeral extractive cultural action that sort of dips in and out of the conflict without a sense of what happens the day after the happening. Instead, we've been advocating for a longer view of resistance in this part of the world. We're advancing a more systematic approach to the drivers of injustice and more strategic thinking about cultural, institutional, and spatial transformation in this border region. For this, we have designed a system that connects our design lab with conditions in the field. And we've built a network of sanctuary spaces on both sides of the wall called the UCSD Community Stations. They have become the sort of social arm of our research-based practice inside of the university, and they enable horizontal flows and continuities between our lab and the field. Here, universities and communities meet to share knowledges and resources and to collaborate on research, dialogue, cultural and educational activities, and urban design build projects, including migrant housing and environmental infrastructure. From this work, several core commitments have emerged, what we call building blocks that ground our research-based practice. As we move through our talk today, you will encounter a series of yellow pages that illustrate where these building blocks emerge in the work. They are drawn from our new book, Spatializing Justice, which will be published this fall with MIT Press and Hadjik Kantz. The larger monograph on the right will appear just afterwards in winter. So I will begin by introducing several building blocks. Teddy will then take you on a tour of these sanctuary spaces, these community station sites, with a deep dive into two of them that focus on migrant housing, one on each side of the border, and then I will conclude with a few words about how our work connects, this local work connects with border zones across the world. So to begin, we radicalize the local. 
we've always resisted the idea that global justice is something that happens out there in the world somewhere. Living and working where we do, we don't need to go far away to engage territorial conflict, migration, poverty, and climate injustice. We are minutes away from an international border in crisis, and this enables an amazing proximity between studio and field, between theory and practice, what we think of as a critical proximity. Of course, going local here means recognizing ourselves as a region, a site of interdependence and cooperation. Despite the wall and the ugly political rhetoric that's designed to divide us, we are a binational ecology of flows and circulation, and our future here is intertwined. Air, water, waste, health, culture, money, hope, justice. These things don't stop at walls. Border zones are unrelentingly porous things. And these flows shape the transgressive hybrid identities and everyday practices in this part of the world. We are committed to decolonizing knowledge. We are keenly attuned to power dynamics when universities arrive in communities and are critical of both extractive research methods and humanitarian problem solving missions. We don't do applied research and we don't do charity. Design culture is filled with vertical assumptions, right? That we know more, that we are trained to solve the world's problems if only they would listen to us. We are committed to horizontal practices of co-production, engaging communities as partners with knowledges and agency. Everyone contributes, everyone learns, and we do things together in the border region that no one could do alone. Along these lines, institutions with power too often take for granted the resources that communities invest when they work with us. Time, space, social capital, labor, knowledge. As a matter of epistemic justice and labor equity, these contributions need to be validated and compensated. So we build trust bridges, long-term partnerships between our university and border communities. We're not like so many university programs that come and go, diagnosing crises, extracting data, and then disappearing. We don't disappear. We're there for the long haul. We're committed to learning from the bottom up. We condemn the forces that marginalize people into slums, but we're continually inspired by the ingenious self-built logics, the vibrancy of informal market dynamics, and the solidarity of communities confronting marginalization, scarcity, and danger. While the informal border neighborhoods where we work are typically denigrated by formal planners and policymakers as ugly, criminal, neglected, to be avoided, cleared, to be cleaned up, we observe intensely active, creative urban agents who challenge the dominant paradigms of neoliberal growth that exclude them. These counter hegemonic practices demonstrate other and more inclusive and collective ways of inhabiting the city. Ultimately, we are engaged in a cultural project here of building what we call a cross-border citizenship culture in the San Diego Tijuana region. A sense of belonging that is defined not by the nation state or the documents in your pocket, but by the shared interests and aspirations among people who inhabit a violently disrupted civic space. Those who benefit from narratives of separation and mistrust prefer that we remain a fragmented public here, that the idea of citizenship divides us rather than unites. We seek to inspire more inclusive imaginaries of belonging and coexistence in this contested territory. Border regions are a natural laboratory for reimagining citizenship along these lines. Our cultural strategies are inspired by a 20th century lineage of Latin American civic experimentation and urban pedagogy. In contexts of dramatic violence and social fragmentation, cities like Porto Alegre, Brazil, and Bogota and Medellin, Colombia, sought to heal the wounds of history and mobilize a cohesive civic identity through participatory cultural action. 
the way the city of Bogota, for example, used street mines, urban games, and theatrical public disruptions to transform urban norms from the bottom up, or the way Medellin transformed urban remainders and neglected zones into vibrant civic spaces that prioritized access and education. Our community stations are inspired by Medellin's now legendary Library Parks project. Basically, it's a model of urban co-development between public universities, municipalities, and community organizations to build spaces of dignity in the city's periphery programmed for education and civic activity. Every UCSD community station is designed, funded, built, programmed, and maintained collaboratively between the campus and the community. We believe public space must be a public good, activated for civic dialogue and infused with resources to increase public knowledge and capacity for political and environmental action. We reject conventional strategies of urban beautification that turn our public spaces into an exclusive enclaves of consumption that typically only benefit the private developers. So now we will take you on a tour of the UCSD community stations and just a hint about what goes on inside of them. So for us then, urban justice is a distributive concept. It entails not only redistributing resources, but also redistributing knowledges. As a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the wall, the community stations specialize social justice. We designed this reciprocal knowledge infrastructure as both a collaborative education platform, but also a model of shared urban intervention. We claimed that the economic and programmatic power of our public university can be leveraged for communities to develop their own public spaces and social housing. The community stations are a platform for co-producing the city with migrant communities. We have co-developed four in total, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana, and we will share with you two that focus on emergency and migrant housing. Once, uh, on each side, uh, one is on each side of the border. Let's go on a tour starting on our campus at our university and moving from north to south. The UCSD Casa Community Station is a partnership with a nonprofit organization Casa Familiar, a 30-year-old community-based social service organization. It is located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro, site of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere. The community is 90% Latinx and has one of the highest unemployment rates, lowest median household income, and worst air quality in San Diego County. Over the years, San Isidro has been our laboratory for researching the positive impact of immigrants in the transformation of American neighborhoods. We have documented how Tijuana's non-conforming land uses migrate north, and as this bottom-up heterogeneous mixed uses cross the border, how these pixels of difference transform the large homogeneous swaths of exclusionary land uses of San Diego's sprawl into more sustainable, plural and complex environments. When Tijuana's confetti, as we call it, of non-conforming land uses hits the ground in San Diego, it alters existing mono-use parcels across inner city neighborhoods into more complex social, economic, and cultural environments. These are migrant urbanizations of retrofit, as older neighborhoods are adapted into alternative mixed uses and bottom-up spaces of socialization and economy. These practices reflect the everyday survival strategies of migrant communities, negotiating boundaries, spaces, and resources. This is how uh, cookie-cutter subdivisions in San Diego are adapted and retrofitted by migrant communities, such as this mid-city post-war bungalow that was transformed into a Buddhist temple by Vietnamese immigrants. Who would imagine that the post-war American dream, exemplified by the detached single-family suburban dwelling, would be retrofitted over time by in the entrepreneurial energies of migrant communities who thread small, small parcels in neighborhoods into social spatial fabrics? 
Community groups like the Buddhist temple also become mediating agencies to facilitate linkages between top-down institutional support systems and bottom-up community agency, bundling local economic capabilities and coordinating a social safety net at the scale of the neighborhood. Researching these cross-border migrant flows has been essential for us as we propose new migrant housing paradigms. We believe that no advances in social housing design can be achieved without advances in housing policy and economy. This includes transformations in exclusionary land use and zoning policy and a new political economy that can support alternative social densities, transitional uses and shared economies found within this migrant urbanization. All of this depends on designing new cross-sector collaborations for co-producing the city. The UCSD CASA community station begins with the adaptive reuse of a beloved historic church that sat for decades in disrepair and which uh, we were able to rescue through this project. During construction, the building had to be lifted to install new foundations. During times of so much political violence inflicted on this border community, the surreal image of the church levitating with Tijuana's informal settlements in the distance inspired a sense of hope for local residents. With the renovation of this historic building as a catalyst, we initiated a process to transform small parcels in this low-income migrant neighborhood into infrastructures for social, economic, and cultural production, reorganizing small lots into linear public systems to strengthen and expand an existing network of old alleys that are used by migrant residents as informal pedestrian corridors. This neighborhood-based urban framework supported our design of the UCSD community station. The project is a double, uh, a, as, a, it has a double aspiration. On one hand, a parcel-sized social infrastructure made of spaces for cultural and economic activity is flanked by social housing. The organizational design of the parcel through a system of linear strips with a variety of small scale buildings performing different roles was also a deliberate stra strategy to mobilize diverse financial streams to fund the different building typologies, synergizing university, community, and foundation economic resources. Our grassroots organization partner, Casa Familiar, has become, in other words, an alternative developer of social housing for its own community, and public space was the detonator. We renovated a historic church into a community theater with an outdoor stage, and this performance space is flanked on one side by a series of small accessory buildings for Casa Familiar's social programming, and on the other side by an open-air civic classroom pavilion. This social, educational, and cultural infrastructure anchors 10 units of social housing at both ends of the parcel, all mediated by pedestrian walkways. We completed construction of this station in February, just before COVID, uh, the COVID lockdowns, and uh, the residents moved in. It's finally opening up, and we are very excited because it is a site built for social proximity. We are returning now to in-person engagement to develop the cultural programming that will uh, fill the spaces with uh, social activity. What we're trying to say here ultimately is that affordable housing or social housing takes on a different meaning when it is threaded into spaces for social programming, summoning residents to participate in the development of local economy and cultural productivity synergizing, in other words, spaces, programs, resources, and people. This is an integrated socio-spatial system that is programmed by university and community. Our programming focuses on cultural processes that expose injustice and increase neighborhood capacity. Let's imagine a small coalition of local artists, neighborhood activists, and neighborhood youth collaborating with university curators, theater script writers, and visual artists who come together to co-produce a play, a theater play, or a musical performance 
that explores an urgent issue facing the community, and all of that is enacted by local youth in the community theater. These cultural productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidentiary material to increase public knowledge and policy transformation. Before moving across the border, uh, allow me to pause for a moment just to summarize how our UCSD CASA community station exemplifies several building blocks in our practice. In conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic, and cultural support. In other words, we must rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational social systems. Housing must be public infrastructure. Density should not be measured as an abstract number of objects or people per area. Density must be understood instead as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Migrant neighborhoods have taught us that these exchanges mobilized by bottom-up urbanization is the DNA for democratizing the city into more inclusive and plural environments. Zoning must stop being punitive, preventing socialization. Instead, it should be conceptualized as a generative tool that anticipates, stimulates, and organizes social and economic activity in neighborhoods. The developer pro forma, or the business plan, I don't know how you call it in Europe, of the developer, of the private developer, is architecture's financial plastic. Inside the mathematics of this spreadsheet, our services as architects, at least in the US, amounts to 15% of the project's construction costs. This undercapitalized asset can be mobilized as collateral for development. Nothing should prevent us architects from becoming developers of our own projects. And by association, nothing should prevent communities from doing the same. In other words, the sweat equity of architects, the sweat equity of cultural producers and community leaders, the economic equity of public universities and municipal protocols for accessing public parcels, all of that can be bundled, aggregated, to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. That really has been our story of the last decades. Moving now uh, across the border, our two community stations, uh, our two community stations in Tijuana are located in the Laureles Canyon, an informal settlement adjacent to the border wall. I will take a few moments to describe this incredible uh, context. This location, is at an important juncture of conflict. Here, the topography of Tijuana's canyons clash with the border wall before spilling northbound into an environmentally protected estuary in San Diego, which is now layered with security infrastructure. At this hotspot, the conflict between natural and jurisdictional systems, between ecological and political priorities is profound. As we zoom in further, we witness a collision between the estuary in the US, the border wall, and the informality of the Laureles Canyon, which is home to 100,000 people. This aerial video shows Laureles Canyon and the precarious condition of the informal settlement that has sprawled on the slopes. This site sits barely 30 minutes away from our campus and demonstrates the dramatic proximity of wealth and extreme poverty in our region. Laureles Canyon is impacted by dump sites, drastic erosion, flooding, and landslides, and all of this is exacerbated by the dramatic precipitation fluctuations of climate change. Because Laureles Canyon lacks water and waste management infrastructure to mitigate these impacts, most, much of the trash, along with tons of sediment, flows up uh, downstream, ending in the estuary in San Diego contaminating this bioregional and shared by national asset. In other words, here at this contested site, the border wall is an artifact of environmental insecurity. These impacts have intensified in recent years because of a profound lack of collaboration between San Diego and Tijuana to manage these cross-border flows. In the last decades, 
70% of the open lands in Laureles Canyon have been lost to irregular urban growth. We have been identifying and bundling squatted, unsquatted lands in the settlement that are still environmentally rescuable to shape an archipelago of conservation. We are advancing an ambitious regional project called the Cross-Border Commons, an environmental conservation initiative that links the estuary in the US with the informal settlement in Mexico, forming a continuous social and ecological envelope that transgresses the wall and protects the environmental systems shared between these two border cities. With our Tijuana partners, we have curated a coalition of state and municipal agencies, nonprofits and universities on both sides of the wall, and have negotiated with the municipality in Mexico to adopt the remaining on squatted public lands inside the informal settlement. Another important contextual note before I introduce one of the Tijuana's uh, stations is that this uh, location, this canyon, this informal settlement is a site obviously of informal urbanization. As we have researched and written about over many years, the informal settlements of Tijuana are built with the urban waste from San Diego, recycling architectural parts to construct habitation and infrastructure. We have learned a great, a great deal from these incremental building practices as people construct their own shelter in layers over time. In a case study we documented, a metal frame appeared from one day to another in a couple of months, recycled materials began to thread the spaces, and in the next weeks, an informal house emerged. We have also taken note that here, multinational maquiladoras surround these informal settlements to benefit from easy access to cheap labor. So over the years, we have been experimenting with factory-made material systems to structurally mediate the recycling of waste. We have proposed an ethical loop where multinational factories invest in emergency housing. Here we are inside Mecalux, a Spanish maquiladora that produces lightweight metal shelving systems for global export, adapting its prefabricated parts into structural scaffold, scaffolds for informal housing. We design a catalog with the factory's engineers to test a variety of prototypes and configurations. And the first Mechalux typology is shown here with adapted recycled urban waste from San Diego, illustrating how top-down institutional resources can support the bottom-up creative intelligence of informal urbanization. A couple of years ago, we built the first, uh, the first uh, typology being, being inside the, the multinational factory, redirecting its material systems and surplus value to sites of emergency was an important milestone in our uh, research-based practice. So uh, it was important to introduce you briefly to these contextual processes because our community stations in Tijuana operate within this rich ecology of social, environmental, economic, and material relations. Now we will share one of those stations in Tijuana. The UCSD Alacran Community Station is located in the most rugged, precarious, and polluted soft basin of the canyon. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organization led by activist pastors Gustavo Banda and Zaida Guillén. With limited resources, they began uh, to build a refugee camp to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees while they navigate on just asylum processes, processes in the US and Mexico. And with the help of skilled migrants, they began building their own emergency housing. We have established now a long-term partnership with them to co-develop a community station here to increase refugee housing capacity. We are accelerating production of Mechalux frames to install them on vernacular post and beam concrete systems into a housing infrastructure. Together, we are building Sanctuary Frontera, which is basically a housing scaffold that will be built first 
leaving the interiors as planned open systems equipped with utilities to support incremental live work configurations. These envelopes will be infilled through time by the migrant residents themselves. We see migrant housing as a mechanism for generating jobs. So in order to sustain the construction process over time, we design a sanctuary economy, embedding housing in spaces of fabrication, training, and small-scale economic development. We have assembled a refugee cooperative called the Little Haiti Construction Company with a tool library, wood and metal machines, and a couple of trucks and tractors. The community uh, will complete construction of this site and the cooperative will remain operational for future habitat restoration jobs across the canyon to advance our cross-border commons. Santuario Frontera began construction last summer. Um, began construction, this is a, uh, the, the cross-border commons, the cross-border conservancy project. Santuario Frontera began construction last summer. The migrant community assembled the Mechalux shelving systems into housing frames. Um, we also uh, began the healing of the topography, creating hydrofiltration channels, gabion walls, terracing, and uh, water collection systems. Advancing migrant housing, which is a major part of our interest here, as a restorative ecological infrastructure. We are now uh, developing a full-on sanctuary neighborhood with social services, a school, hydroponics farm, health clinic, a co uh, collective kitchen, and, an econo and economic incubators. For us, refugee uh, shelters are a global laboratory for rethinking the city as a more integrative and inclusive ecosystem, where infrastructure is an agile and anticipatory social spatial system capable of negotiating both transition and rootedness, the ephemeral and the permanent. We are also designing mobile systems such as this nomadic clinic we are co-developing with medical schools on both sides of the border equipped with telemedicine capacities which can detach from the mothership to penetrate more deeply into remote areas of the Laureles Canyon where migrants are settling. Currently, our pedagogic and cultural programming at the station focuses on social protection of uh, landslides, floods, and estuary health beyond the wall. We lead educational programming through which young people understand zones of vulnerability in their own neighborhoods, emphasizing conservation of species and habitat restoration. It's never too early to begin. We have in fact committed here to elevating children as the cross-border citizens of the future. Santuario Frontera, our project here, has advanced important building blocks for our practice, two in particular. Urban informality decolonizes the meaning of infrastructure. For us, the informal is not just an aesthetic category, but a praxis, a, a dynamic set of urban operations from below that counter and transgress top-down political power and exclusionary economic models. And hospitality, while it is the first gesture when the uh, immigrant arrives, an essential charitable opening, a first step in creating a more welcoming society. As, need, as needs become more complex over time, charity is not the appropriate model for building an inclusive society. We need to move from hospitality to inclusion. So thinking beyond shelter is a call for rethinking refugee camps everywhere, from places of short-term habitation and service provision to durable infrastructures for inclusion. So there's so much more to say about the community stations, about our amazing partners and what we do together in these spaces. While they all focus on different issues that reflect the priority of each of these communities, they all aspire to foster solidarity and collective agency and to counter exploitation, dispossession, deportation, and environmental crisis. Racist political narratives in the United States portray the border as a site of rupture and criminality, 
but through the stations, we are committed to generating different stories about life in this region that are grounded in the experiences of those who inhabit it. We are a region of flows and circulations, regardless of the wall that restricts the movement of our bodies. We want to cultivate an elastic civic identity here from the bottom up, ultimately to reimagine jurisdiction in a militarized border zone. We curate unwalling experiments that dissolve the wall using visual tools like diagrams and radical cartographies that situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence from local to regional to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see elasticity as a civic skill, to be able the, you know, the ability to stretch and return over and again to expansive ways of thinking about uh, solidarity across walls. Here at the border, the idea of the bioregion, the binational watershed system, has been a powerful imaginary for activating more elastic civic thinking here. Several years ago, we curated a cross-border public action through one of the sewage drains that the U.S. had carved into the wall between the Loreles Canyon and the estuary that Teddy introduced, introduced you to. We negotiated a permit with border control to transform the drain into an official port of entry southbound for 24 hours. They agreed, disarmed, that we were just artists, as long as Mexican immigration was waiting on the other side to stamp our passports. Our convoy was comprised of 300 local activists, representatives from both cities, and border activists from around the world. We summoned agencies who are typically at odds with one another. And as we moved together southbound under the wall, we witnessed slum wastewater and plastics flowing northbound toward the estuary beneath our feet. This strange crossing from estuary to slum through a militarized culvert and the stamping of passports on the other side amplified the most profound interdependencies of our region. The great insight here was that protecting the vulnerable U.S. estuary demands shared investment in the informal Mexican settlement. So in this cultural experiment, we went down. But sometimes nurturing elastic civic thinking requires ascending above. Imagine a migrant child standing right here, hundreds of feet above the border wall at a place called Mirador. Imagine she plants her feet facing west with the blue Pacific Ocean in front of her, Mexico to her left, the U.S. to her right. Below to her immediate left, she sees the informal settlement where she lives. She can spot her house and so forth, and she can recognize its proximity to a country that she and her family are not permitted to enter. Below to her immediate right, almost directly beneath her feet, she sees the border wall, which from this vantage looks like a flimsy and ridiculous strip inserted into a vast and powerful natural system. Lifting her eyes, she sees the Tijuana River estuary with its vulnerable wetland habitats. And further beyond still, you can't see it in this photo, downtown San Diego rising vertically into the sky. From this vantage, all the characters of this contested zone come to life. We've witnessed this moment of recognition again and again over the years. There are few places on earth where the collision of informality, militarization, environmental vulnerability, and the proximity of wealth and poverty can be so vividly experienced. But in reality, the conflicts that we experience here locally between nation and nature are reproduced again and again along the entire trajectory of the continental border between the US and Mexico. Over the years, we have collected aerial photos like these that document precise moments when the jurisdictional line collides with natural systems, powerfully illustrating what dumb sovereignty looks like when it hits the ground in a complex bioregion. Our Mexus project then imagines what this continental border zone becomes without the line. Mexus dissolves the border into a bioregion whose shape is defined by the eight binational watershed systems bisected uh, by the wall. Mexus also explores other systems and flows across this bioregional territory, 
tribal nations, protected lands, crop lands, urban crossings, many more informal ones, 15 million people and much more. Ultimately, Mexus challenges America's wall building fantasies with more expansive imaginaries of citizenship and cooperation beyond the nation state. Here it is in 2018 at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Now the final civic stretch, literally, and the end of our talk is a visualization project we call the political equator, which traces an imaginary line from San Diego, Tijuana across the planet, forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30th and 38th parallels north. Along its trajectory lie some of the world's most contested and violent thresholds. The US-Mexico border at San Diego, Tijuana, which is the most trafficked international checkpoint in the Western Hemisphere. The Strait of Gibraltar in the Mediterranean, the main routes from North Africa into fortress Europe. The Israeli-Palestinian border that divides the Middle East. India, Kashmir, a site of enduring territorial conflict since British partition. The border between North and South Korea, representing decades of intractable Cold War conflict and China's accelerating militarization of the Ch South China Sea, along with Taiwan and Hong Kong. Now, visualizing this political equator in red alongside the climatic equator below here in green was an astonishing discovery for us because the ribbon in between them, give or take a few degrees, contains our planet's most populous slums its sites of greatest natural resource extraction and export, and its zones of greatest political instability, climate vulnerability, and human displacement. And when these parallel equators are applied to the Pierce Quincuncial projection from above, the Arctic is centered, with its melting ice caps detonating sea level rise, dramatic coastal vulnerability, and human displacement. In the end, the collision of nationalism and border building, climate catastrophe, and dramatic movement of people is the global injustice trifecta of our time. But as we said at the beginning, these dynamics always hit the ground somewhere and are experienced by people locally in everyday places like ours and like yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we know it was a lot, but we we wanted to share the cro uh, the cross section of of our passions in, in the last years. It is safe to say that that's quite powerful. <laughs> I want to really, um, for now and Teddy, to to thank you very much for this fantastic lecture, and uh, I'm just thinking that uh, as um, as architects, we talk very often about scale. And in fact, uh, listening to your lecture, there is no scale. There is only one dimension. It is a dimension of the reality, which goes from the world questions and problems to the super small little rooms, bedrooms in some situations. And this, for me, is very, very interesting because we, we deal with the human, we deal with the, the people, we shake the hands of the people. And this is, for me, the, the real dimension as that we, as architect, you, we have to, to, to work with and you do it so well. And it also talks about our incredible responsibility as architect when we have to build walls and what is a wall and when we see this uh, and this is very interesting with what we what we see in your constructions it is skeletons bones structures most of the time there is no wall and i think it's interesting to see this dimension of walls and the definition of walls at all these dimensions uh, precisely at the situation between tijuana and san diego Thanks, 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 really uh, very, very interesting. And uh, but I, I want to, to leave the students uh, with their questions now. Uh, Thank you, Jean-Philippe. Sorry, I would uh, hand over the word to you maybe for you to open up the uh, round of questions and just a short reminder again, 
the live chat is open, the Telegram channel is open. If anyone has a question, shoot and we will read them out. Yeah, so also uh, from my side, thank you very much. That was incredibly interesting. Um, I was wondering if um, through your architecture and which has influence on a lot of um, social problems, um, if you have already experienced that that brought uh, some political change. Do you want me to begin for now? You, uh, why don't you why don't you take that? Uh, yes, thank you, Tristan. Um, as we discussed, obviously, for us, uh, urban conflict has always been a creative tool. And so part of the processes that we open up in our projects always begin with asking uh, really what produced the conflict? What are the conditions that produce the conflict? What are the institutional mechanisms that have produced so much oppression and marginalization and exclusion? So those are pieces and fragments of the political itself, of institutional, the, the institutional myopia that sometimes perpetuates those uh, conditions of crisis. So entering into a project of institutional critique uh, and entering into understanding really what are those conditions is definitely a, an act of design in a sense. And so um, many of the projects that we are doing have really pushed at the institutions. For example, even in our, un, our own university, uh, convincing the structure, the, the, the protocols themselves, transforming the protocols of research and education, what determines research, what determines, you know, um, a community engaged um, a, um, no, a education, for example. So having created an infrastructure uh, of, of resources, of programs and knowledges was really an act of institutional transformation on one hand, which is really about the kind of political structure as well, and the political economy ultimately of how universities, particularly public universities like ours, most commit to investing in, in those communities who surround them. And, and there are many instances like that, but I, I just to say the transformation of zoning envelopes in the neighborhoods that we have uh, uh, worked with, um, uh, the, the, the challenging of reductive uh, interpretations of land use to expand even meanings of public space, all of that has depended on very uh, committed uh, uh, institutional, uh, you know, in, uh, transformation. So we have been in constant communication with many of those institutions um, that we, we ultimately are trying to push to reimagine their own policies. In that sense, our work really is about mediating the top down and the bottom up. We carry the knowledge of from below, knock on the doors of the political structures to push them to transform many of those policies. And the same thing has been happening in Tijuana as well in the context of um, access to uh, eminent domain processes, uh, uh, land, land trusts, uh, the, the establishing other types of modalities so that communities can be in charge of their own modes of production, of their own, uh, let's say, capabilities when it comes to economic sustainability. So yes, I think based on your question, Tristan, I think that a, a lot of what, you know, inspires us and therefore also makes us into a very masochistic uh, architectural and research practices that we're interested ultimately in, in institutional transformation. Fona, I don't know if you wanted to add to that or. I was just simply going to add that, you know, this is something that we, that we work on with our students, um, expanding the role that architects can play in the transformation of the city carrying the knowledge that's often off the radar or invisible to policymakers and formal planners, adjusting the way they understand growth in the city based on the way things are actually happening on the ground. So as Teddy described it, we almost see ourselves as urban curators and ensuring that knowledge is flowing and moving among groups and people and decision makers and funders that need, that need to hear from one another. Right, so it's a, a kind of a, a mediatory practice, um, which is why we we call ourselves not only an architectural practice, but a, but a political one or a civic one. I had a question exactly about that because um, I was wondering, um, maybe on an organizational 
layer of things, how do you actually, um, like what media or medium do you use to get in contact with the communities? Is it, I don't know, an email or by post or, <laughs> um, or like who do you reach out for so that they can use, you know, their contacts to reach out and then once you have them together, these are a lot of questions coming together, I realize. Mm -hmm. um, but and once you have them together, like, how do you mediate? How do you, like, do you ask specific questions that are very small and then the conversations become very big or very big questions and then specific answers are coming in or like, because it seems like such an important mm -hmm. factor, but some, something that really needs to be structured incredibly well so that you can actually find what people mm -hmm. need or want to say. So what your question points to is how incredibly time intensive this work is um, and the importance of building trust with communities. So deepening knowledge of the context and understanding together where the gaps are, or where new knowledges or new resources are needed. I mean, it's all about talking. It's all about face to face meeting. I mean, we meet with our partners weekly, sometimes daily on projects to really understand. So we're we're working very closely together. We're swimming together through these waters, which are complex and arriving at the challenges we need to face together. So, you know, COVID for that reason was a huge challenge in, you know, in particularly communicating with our partners across the border who are confronting really kind of Byzantine and complex urban planning processes and so forth. Um, and for that reason, we actually installed uh, computer labs inside of our community station sites in Tijuana so that we could maintain communications during COVID virtually, sort of transgressing the wall with technology, but we had to maintain constant contact. Um, this is really what we've learned is at the basis of, of building trust with communities. Like I said, we don't disappear. Uh -huh. We're there. That's right. right. We're there. And in that sense, and in that sense, Helen, uh, part of what has defined our practice is that we've decided to make it into an throughout the years into an embedded practice. We decided to commit all of our work and resources and knowledge to really, you know, focusing on very specific border neighborhoods. So, part of the trust is that we've been working with these communities for many years. These projects and these efforts began in a way with not that much in the beginning, years ago, but only with accompanying those processes, being there with our communities through a variety of dialogical processes, uh, designing community workshops together, having meetings uh, where we, were, we would criticize together the, the paradigms of municipal advocacy planning which was always only defending developers and taking advantage of poor communities by only speaking about urban development through the lens of style and, and the packaging of identity through facadism, et cetera. So, in other words, we became accomplices in, in understanding that our knowledge is needed to meet. That's another thing that has been very important here, how nonprofit organizations with their own biases, their own cliches and their own sort of at times protectionist agendas, meet our own cliches, our own agendas, and how we really begin to open up in a more humble way to really let those knowledges interpenetrate. So designing processes together, this is what opened up a lot of trust and, and obviously working with them for many years. Um, and, and if you are present, after, you know, because the, the moment we met them, they said, oh, you are other architects who come in and maybe next month you will be you, you will be gone or another university program who just comes here to take advantage of us using us as objects of analysis and then you'll disappear. So, yes, we decided let us be present and let's bring our students so that experientially they can really understand the issues, not just abstractly. Uh, and so all of that begins to really allow our partners to really accept us as part of their family, I think. If, if I could um, just ask a quick follow up, <laughs> uh, because in some of the pictures, I, for example, um, I saw that they, that the people in the photographs, for example, they were like cutting out things that they were putting in a model, or there was this very big model that had like this landscape or something. So I realized that this might seem like a very profane question, but um, I'm just so interested in like, what is it, you know, like, is it a model that you feel like 
helps at a certain point in conversation or lists or drawings? Does everyone get a pen and mm. there's one big piece of paper or is there a lot of tiny different piece of paper, pieces of paper? So like how, like what, what kind of like <laughs> needs of expression uh, apart from the, the verbal communication, would you say that, 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 very relevant to you? Yeah, no, no Helen, that's wonderful. They're asking those questions. I see that you want to get into the details of how, you know, these processes, which is great. This is really our questions too. Let us be specific, right? Uh, I think that in essence, it, we have been convinced that models, visualizations, the act of making with the community is an, a way of allowing art and architecture to be a kind of visual and cognitive system to allow the community or to invite the community to have access to the complexity of certain concepts, to the complexity of urban policy. Uh, so we have co-designed with the community uh, models that are pulled apart to understand topography, to understand water flow, to understand the different scales of the watershed, right? To, to, to understand that if a, a child from that informal settlement in Mexico throws a piece of trash on the creek, not only is going to undermine the livability of that child and the community, but it will affect and impact the estuary down below on the other side of that wall. And so visualization, cartography, uh, the, the, we are very interested in designing new community workshop models where, where models and visualizations become tools uh, for increasing community capacity for political action. I and mean, and that's really at the bottom of it. You know, it's, it's ultimately for us, everything begins as a cultural intervention or a cultural project. And one of the things, and our anthropologist friends get very upset when we say this, but what happens is when you live, you know, in conditions of poverty and it's generational and it's cyclical, you begin to naturalize the conditions as normal in the way of the world. So the whole, you know, the whole the whole point is to sort of break those biases, to rupture perceptions and attitudes that maintain the status quo, right? So how to see things anew, like that idea of ascending above and looking over the territory and perceiving it, you know, through a new through a new lens. There's a tendency to naturalize injustice. So, like for example, the border communities where we work, the air quality is atrocious because of all of the idling cars at the border that can't cross and people are breathing this in and they developed lung disease and they just chalk that up to the way of the world. Well, that's just the way it is here. No, let's visualize the sort of processes and the decisions that were made that put your child's school next to an active freeway, right? There were decisions that made this injustice what it is. So we want to expose through reframing and revisualizing reality and by the way those images uh, become political tools yeah not only for the community to understand land use to understand zoning and all of that but also in our case they have been instrumental in changing the imagination of political actors in the municipality so i don't know if you remember in one of the slides we showed an image of land use at the border where the pixels of Tijuana's informal uses have begun, and we said, we argue that they, they begin to infiltrate themselves into the large swaths of exclusionary zoning in San Diego. That notion, when we presented it to a politician in San Diego, a city council member, he understood finally that we could be speaking of immigrants in a more positive way because they are helping us to transform neighborhoods that are mono-use and, and homogeneous into more sustainable economic uh, and social, uh, you know, uh, laboratories in a sense. So, in other words, land use, cross-border land use was visualized uh, uh, as part of our dialogues uh, with the community because a, 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 a cross-border land use map does not exist, by the way. San Diego has its own land use maps, Tijuana, and they never really look at them together. So that's the kind of thing that sometimes we do with our partners is to produce new type of cartographies, uh, you know, in order to inspire a new, a new debate about the interdependencies between these two border cities. Yeah, I was uh, one, thank you. Uh, of course, thank you for that answer. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, there was uh, another question coming in um, again, somewhat 
detailed, if you will, because it does concern like the actual body of the uh, architectural designs that you put forth. And it is about like the construction methods. And uh, like, so what type of like construction do you often work with or you like to work with and how maybe also do the, uh, that does the communication with the community like inform the choices that you make in, in construction aesthetics and design? And yeah, what is kind of like the interplay between um, financial factors, industrial sect uh, uh, factors, and you know what what you can uh, what you can yes. get there to the building lot. Um, what you've talked about before with the communities, like how would you say you manage in that field? Yes, and, and just like Jean Philippe Vassal and Anne Lacaton, who have been incredible inspirations for us to really understand the political economy of construction, to really transcend the kind of recipes of development, right? That, that make affordable housing or social housing, it's just really an issue of size, reducing right into micro units, what otherwise should be a lot more expansive as a kind of act of living and, 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 and interaction. So uh, the idea of materiality, uh, economy of material and construction, all of that has been in our minds. Uh, obviously, part of working in, in an environment that is a binational or a border, a border environment, we, we are constantly oscillating between, between two different ways of building, two different ways of constructing the city. Uh, often we say to intervene in San Diego is to almost bring informality into what otherwise is hugely homogeneous and formal just to informalize the formal a little bit. And while in Tijuana, where everything is a lot more vibrant and dynamic and informal, we also are aware that we need to formalize just a little what, what, what in, the informal can offer. So, so both of those processes really require different sensibilities to material uh, execution and also understanding not only material, but the scale of operation. In, in San Diego, that project that we showed very quickly, which is made of small buildings, was a way for us to challenge uh, how developers have gotten away from small scale incremental development, which was very powerful in the years of the New Deal in the United States. Communities building duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes to support their own economies. And we want to bring that back, for example, through the construction, small buildings that interact inside small parcels. And in Tijuana, obviously through working with uh, incremental construction, we have the interventions there for, for a long time have been simply curating ways of producing, you know, systems to assemble recycled material in a more, uh, in a more effective way, more functional way, learning from the informal. Uh, but the more we have begun to finally build, uh, we have been understanding that it's about, again, being curators to mobilize resources and institutional synergies or collaborations. So we said, instead of rushing to the informal settlement to build housing for the poor, which oft is our critique of, of, of agencies of charity, like Habitat for Humanity, who sometimes just come to the informal settlements to build boxes, but they, they never build communities, or they are never in, involved in challenging land um, uh, property ownership or uh, the accountability of institutions like the factories that we we engage. So we said instead of rushing to the informal settlement to build uh, just housing on its own, let's go to the factory because they are they must be accountable. They get the labor, the cheap labor from these informal settlements. They set settle adjacent to those informal. They have materials. They have resources. So there, they, the site of intervention became the factory where we were adapting their assembly line very lightly to, to maintain the economy of scale. And we redirected the resources to the, to the informal settlement and the community we are working with. And at that point, we decided instead of reinventing the wheel, let's just use what is vernacular to those communities, which is really post and beam concrete, uh, even though concrete and its production has become also problematic in the context of climate because of the amount of emissions. Uh, we, we are trying to figure out how we produce a very different composition there. Um, uh, but nevertheless, is a vernacular because people do, do it themselves. And so we were trying to marry, or how do you say, to join a factory made specialization with a more vernacular, local, hands on, you know, 
uh, economy. So, so, and from there, a very material as a layer, something that also we learned from Jean-Philippe and Anne, is that we can work with layers of material. So something plastics or uh, coverings that are very affordable can protect from the rain, while inside we can build something uh, more, um, maybe not, not to say permanent, but something that doesn't require the expensive details for waterproofing. You see what I'm saying? So, so what buildings within buildings within buildings. Yeah. Let me just say something here too, and and this is probably obvious when Teddy was speaking that you're designing these systems and working with different stakeholders, factories, and different sort of funding agencies and so forth. This and in, this incremental way of building sometimes works on a different temporality than the urgency of migration. And so this is, you know, our goal right now is to think about systems that are scalable and replicable so that the groundwork is done and then the process is in motion and it can be scaled uh, and, 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 and really, really copied. But, you know, as, as Teddy mentioned earlier, you know, the conflicts that we face all the time, particularly with agencies that are dealing with migration on the front lines, is that a thousand people will show up in the next days. What do we do with these people? And so we understand the impulses of, you know, international organizations that want to pitch tents and that want to put four walls around human beings. We understand it, but we're trying to devise different models that have more resonance in the long term for building community because, um, you know, one of the things we're really trying to establish, particularly at this, this particular project, is the right to remain, the right to stay. People are on the move and these temporary kind of solutions are not going to meet the challenges we're going to be facing in terms of massive sort of demographic shifts in the coming period. Um, so we're trying to think through these longer term problems. One, one final comment just quickly about materiality and, and, and economy. Uh, the project in, in, in Tijuana that we showed with the frames was all built by migrants. And so we are also trying to figure out here how to really acknowledge the uh, expertise, the, 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 the knowledge really of migrants as they come from Central America and Haiti with incredible capacities to build, but also allow the project to be a way of, uh, to increase capacities. Like a Honduran migrant who became an incredible welder. He never, had never welded in, in Honduras, he was a car mechanic. But in the project, he became a, a specialist almost in welding. So the project really incentivizes acknowledging the sweat equity of labor. And that can be connected again to the, to the uh, subsidy of the factory and our university uh, educational program. So this is what we're trying to say. It's like it's difficult to explain it, but it's about bundling all these capabilities and resources into a system to then transform materiality here less, you know, or uh, often we call this architecture of parts, not, not architecture of objects, but an architecture made of parts that, that are constantly, uh, you know, in, 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 in construction. Maybe for the last question, looking at the time a little bit here, um, a really short one. Um, that is connected to uh, your mentioning of uh, civic pedagogy. I'm having trouble pronouncing it right. Anyways, um, would you have, uh, because you, you were speaking about how to like transform kind of like thoughts about that, uh, would you have um, a reading recommendation for that for us students? Well, apart you from know, your book, of course. <laughs> I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is this wonderful new anthology that was just assembled on the urban practices of Antanas Mogus in Bogota, Colombia. What is the book called, Teddy? Uh, oh, my God. Uh, uh, where, where, where you wrote a piece, right? Uh, uh, the uh, uh, cultural producers, cultural it's producers. Called, it's, cultural, it's called Cultural Agents Reloaded, Harvard University Press. Um, edited by Teddy, Jose Falcone, and no, Jose uh, Falcone um, and 
a Columbia. And, um, anyway, it's a fantastic collection, uh, like a compendium of urban interventions um, that Antanas did. And many of ours are just riffs off of, of many of those, you know. Um, it's a really wonderful um, collection and there's a, a great bibliography in there as well that can point to others. Toccato? Um, uh, Tornato. Carlo, Carlo, Carlo Tognato. Culturally and, and this is, loaded. And, and, yeah. and this is interesting because we, were, we have been lucky, you know, uh, to collaborate, in fact, with some of those actors in Colombia, we collaborated with Antanas Mokus, the former mayor of Bogota, philosopher turned mayor, whose this book is all about his strategies for urban yeah. pedagogy, because yeah. he provocatively told uh, urbanists and planners and architects, you know, before transforming the city physically, we need to transform social norms, behaviors, you should uh, build up what he called the citizenship culture of reciprocity. What are the aspirations we, we are sharing and, and the visions in order to construct the city we want to coexist within? So and by, for us, it's essential because what has happened in the United States is disastrous, right? The loss of trust, the antagonism, the hatred, the, the, the dissolution of a kind of social uh, welfare and ultimately the commitment to a kind of public collective civic imagination, all of that. Antanas Mokus was interested in the pedagogical processes to build trust and to enable that reciprocity. And so incredibly this idiosyncratic. So we brought him, Pona and I brought him to the border and we worked on a, a project together, which, uh, you know, because Antanas Mokus uh, created this citizenship culture survey that he distributed through Latin America, municipalities would get it to understand uh, the kind of weaknesses in, in um, how would I call it, a public policy, where, where we needed to invest. Anyway, he did it in Latin American cities, but we said, Antanas, come to the border, let's do it in two cities that are divided. Is there such a thing as a cross-border citizen, citizenship culture? That's where we really opened up many, many, many of our processes. So yes, we are very interested in changing hearts and minds, in enabling the interface with communities to be co-producers of the kinds of projects we're doing. Education is central uh, and new, new forms of awareness and, and, and trust. So that book is essential then. Great. There's a Thank really wonderful so preface. There's a preface to that book written by or assembled by Jose Falcone, who's a wonderful sort of cultural figure. Um, and he actually found beautiful images of the actual interventions in Bogota with descriptions of each one. There were 40 or 50 of them. And it's 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 really wonderful. It's a big, wonderful book. Thank you so much for um, that recommendation. Um, and also thank you for coming to the Urika Tuesday lecture series. Um, I do feel like this has been somewhat of a grand finale of the semester. You uh, have had the spot of the last lecture this semester. Um, so I would just like to take this chance to say thank you to you. And uh, say again, thank you to all of the lecturers that have shared their knowledge and their visions and their ideas with us. To all the professors that are so kind to um, invite all of these incredible guests. Um, and I would hand over the word to Jean-Philippe Vassal um, for a little wrap up maybe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. And your microphone is still on, uh, off, sorry. Yes, um, thanks, Helen. Thanks, um, Fona and Teddy. It was really um, amazing, fantastic lecture. It's very, very interesting and also uh, I was thinking of the, it was interesting, the, this, this frontier uh, between the North America and South America, Latin America. And uh, we, we know all of us, the, the quality, the cultural quality, uh, the, about uh, architecture in South America, which is very, very interesting. And with your lecture, what is interesting, it is we, we see all, also architecture change and adapt to the uh, uh, problems and questions of the society at uh, and uh, I, I think this this uh, at this point of 
the frontier of Tijuana and uh, and 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 US, a lot of things happen about this history of this culture, and um, I think it was really uh, important to 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 see to to see this precise situation. And really, I really uh, uh, thank you a lot for this uh, for, for this uh, all these uh, beautiful projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean Philippe. It's a pleasure. Yeah. It's just wonderful that you invited us, and um, we hope to see you soon in, in person. We, we we hope and say hello to Anne and and to all the students. Thanks for receiving us, you know, even if, uh, through the computer. But one day we'll come and visit you in person. We'll have a beer together. Uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks you very right. much. Thank you very much. Bye, Helen. Bye, Tristan.